right so good morning all of you uh, a very warm welcome uh, and today's uh, fellows teaching module topic is uh, on osteomyelitis we have a renowned uh, faculty my dear friend dr rudra from uh, bangalore here to talk uh, talk to us about acute osteomyelitis and uh, the practical approach of treatment rudra has huge uh, practice in heading uh, uh, indira gandhi children's hospital at bangalore and running a fellowship program as well so uh, we have uh, added a new feature uh, we will have some polls during the talk uh, in my my uh, case presentation and henceforth we will have uh, uh, polls during the webinar so all the fellows can participate rudra would you uh, start uh, welcome yeah good morning all of you i must uh, say thanks to molin for conducting these programs yeah Gaurav, you program. can present case you know once we finish talk from go so i think i'll go ahead straight away with the talk yeah can you see my screen hope yes. i am audible yes we can see yeah, yeah thank you so today is a important uh, discussion what we are doing today because in our country i think maximum number of cases any general orthopedic surgeon or even a pediatric orthopedic surgeon will be seeing is bone and joint infection for various reasons so this is my hospital those of you don't know about this this is a uh, around 500 bed hospital coming up uh, i mean it is established since 96 this bed in bangalore all of you are welcome to come this is just a a uh, memory you know when molin and the uh, company was there with us two years back for the teaching program of philos nice memories we have let me introduce you that you know this is uh, most of the time these infections are hematogenous what we are talking today is the hematogenous osteomyelitis osteomyelitis can happen for various reasons if there is any local area of infection like from soft tissue to bone or from implants to bone or from an injury that's different this is it's where there is an existing infection and then that travels in the blood and then reaches the bone reasons and the infection settles in and especially this happens in neonates that the, the, the sequelae are quite disastrous we have seen that the um, the late sequelae are so bad you know even though Uh, these children do well immediately soon after the surgery or whatever management later the sequelae is quite bad and most of these infections are bacterial so very rarely it can be fungal also and even viral also it's like so why we are seeing so many infection nowadays probably it is the the infant mortality rate which is which has come down if you look at this graph in 1973 somewhere it was around 140 per 1000 children you know live births now it is about 27% in india so of course india still has to travel a lot this is a good indicator of any country's development and you know the healthcare system so a better healthcare provides a lesser infant mortality rates so all these children who are uh, so called nicu admitted and uh, infants especially uh, graduates and nicu graduates what we call you know, they are quite prone for joint sepsis because of the immunity and other issues and uh, comorbid conditions so always you know we have read in our textbook when we were studying of predicts that the, the kinking of the vessel is the main reason and there are so many reasons hypothecated still so there is another theory which says that the chondrocytes replicating anastomosis in that area comes in the way and then causes vascular engorgement and stasis what are the common questions we get it when we are managing the septic arthritis the common question is how do we diagnose still diagnosis is a challenge um especially in a, a neonate which is admitted in a icu where it is receiving um you know pneumonia treatment or meningitis treatment something else and this subtle infections are uh, quite morbid infections in the bone and joints get missed out and they they present very late and antibiotic policy what antibiotic do we give and uh, how long to give these are the questions everybody has it 
and of course surgical intervention still i have uh, uh, you know i keep hearing that so let us wait for some time and uh, give the antibiotic first there is a lot of vague response about these three things diagnosis antibiotic policy and surgical intervention so neonates you know if you take neonates means it's the life just up to 28 days they are newborns they are they are just uh, neonates are uh, you know the diagnosis as i said is very difficult so only uh, important findings what we get is failure to thrive reduce feeds lethargy these are gentle uh, signs what we have to pick it up and then see so the neonates there is always a overlap of septic arthritis and osteomyelitis sometimes there is coexisting both the both the sites or it may be only one infection usually the these infants are uh, presented with uh, pseudo paralysis i think last week dr shriram was uh, explaining very nicely about the septic arthritis presentation in the signs and symptoms more or less the same criteria as applying in neonates whatever the discussion happened and in an osteomyelitis the swelling can be quite away from the joint or near uh, a, a prominent bone in this case it's this area you can see that there is a lot of destruction going on in this radius and which is almost involving the whole bone and these kind of infections we don't get surprised you know they are quite bad whenever there is abnormal presentation of an infection something like too much of a collection high fever or leukocytosis is very high we have to suspect these aggressive infections by superbugs like mrs so as i said septic arthritis and osteomyelitis can coexist in newborns so based on this duration let us have when do we call acute and chronic things like this is very important for our understanding and management so we call acute only when the diagnosis is within 2 weeks of the, from the onset of symptoms sub acute is 2 weeks onwards and uh, chronic will be after 4 to 6 weeks that they enter the chronic circle this is very important and what are the microbiological spectrum we generally see so you must understand this the 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 the, the enemy of orthopedics is always the staph aureus but it varies from age to age for example if you are managing a neonate the staph aureus is not the one which is commonly causing the infection we have seen in our experience and uh, when i show my slide of the spectrum you will be surprised to see that we have very less uh, amount of uh, a very less number of infections caused by staph aureus in neonates and uh, the common organisms in neonates is streptococcus a uh, series like pyogenes pneumonia beta streptococci coagulase negative staphylococci kingella kinga is another rare organism which can be detected and one should be very careful and have a index of suspicion about all this organism so for that we need to know what are the organism which can infect the bone and gram negative bacilli is quite common again in uh, infants so in our series it is the klebsiella which is ruling our hospital so fungal infections again we had a series of fungal infections in once probably a few years back where uh, every child that getting admitted was getting fungal infection so we went ahead and you know screened the whole hospital we found that there was a fungal cultures in some of the equipments so these things are also important you know from where these uh, infants are getting shifted or from where these children are coming so we have to Uh, go and see there that place also so because ours is a tertiary care and we get referral from another tertiary care hospital so we have a communication with that so as i said kingella kingae especially should be suspected when you have unusual sites of infection like sternum clavicle calcaneum gallus vasus these are quite unusual sites the commonest uh, uh, the bone to get infected is the femur tibia and the long bone of both long bones and even ileum also it's quite rare and especially so when when the these children are less than 2 years the kingella should be suspected of course in our community is not so rampant and this is this is just the research and i and i have seen dr benjamin joseph uh, uh, you know presenting this series as well so quite often the, the the organism isolation is very difficult you know the the culture is most of the time it is negative in fact uh, 30% of our culture in our hospital is negative so this is for various reasons one is the the child or the infant has received so many antibiotics in an icu for suspecting some other infection or 
our cultures are not extended or there are specific way of detecting. So we came to know recently that there can be what we, we always ask for our microbiologists to do an extended culture when there, whenever there is a suspicion of no culture. This is very important and you know, one has to communicate with the microbiologist and uh, see what, because identifying the organism is the most important diagnostic tool in the whole management because it helps not only for the acute management, even in chronic as well. So this is a graph I was just telling you that if you look at this, the, the, the biggest, uh, the second most was MRSA and the first most was the Klebsiella in our uh, NICU admissions. So it's quite rare, mm -hmm. but this is what is happening. Also, the spectrum keeps changing from community where we practice and uh, from places where we are and kind of practice what we are into. For example, if you are in a general hospital, probably primary care for physicians, it may be staph aureus or gram negative strepto in neonates. In children, it is always the staph aureus. Always in children, more than five years, it is staph aureus which takes the lead. So methicillin resistant, uh, this MRSA, what we call superbug, is a new threat. And it is not now. This is these papers are produced, you know, so, uh, published in 2008-9 during those times, 2004 itself. By then itself, the MRSA was very common and it was spreading, and still now it is it is um, it is uh, happening, and we keep seeing these bad infections, and we have we have uh, really you know spent a lot of time with these children who, who get infected with MRSA for a very long time. So one child, I'll share uh, that you know we 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 have uh, we have operated on this child for about seven eight eight times. She's around five six year old child. So this this can happen. MRSA is a bad infection, and the local destruction is quite bad. So one should be very aggressive in surgical management in MRSA, and as early as possible one should intervene. And you can just see this uh, graph where what I've shown. This is just to show you that. The infants below one year, the, these are the common organisms, as I mentioned, streptococcus, hemophilus, staph aureus, Neisseria. And then children one to four years, it is a staph aureus and Kingella, Kingella, and pneumonia. And school age, again, staph aureus will come into picture. And these are the special mentions that hemoglobinopathies, you, you have to remember that the organisms like salmonella can infect the bones. And intravenous drug users, of course, is not so common, but still staph aureus, and E. coli can be the thing. And if there is animal exposure, salmonella species have to be suspected. We have to keep in mind, you know, what are the organism in what situation can be infected, can infect this. So what are the clinical manifestations? So most of the time, this was discussed in the last meeting, but still it's, it's just the pain, which is more important and pseudo paralysis. And then of course the fever, along with the, the uh, other diagnostic tools, like uh, total count, differential counts, all these things. This has been discussed. I'm not going to go in detail. Uh, one should remember that the important investigation in smaller children is ultrasound scan examination. You should have a good ultrasonologist who can discuss with you, and then we can go. We can even pick up this acute osteomyelitis when they are in a subperiosteal, little bit of edema. You know that stage itself, we can pick it up, and you know that's the best thing to do. So between uh, CRP and ESR, these are very good uh, markers for infection. If you see. So there was a, a nice study from here, this clinic orthopedic has published that which are important. It is said that the ESR CRP are equally important for diagnosing the infections, but the CRP gives a better prognostic uh, indication. So how do we diagnose? As I said, none are definitive diagnosed un until we identify the organism. Unfortunately, for various reasons, in some cases, we can't identify them. So, so cultured samples preferably should be from the bone samples, you know, it's not from the blood culture. So bone, if you can directly get the culture from the bone, that's the best thing. Before proceeding, we have to be very sure that what are the differential diagnoses. You know, any bone pain in a child need not be osteomyelitis, especially they can present like an osteomyelitis. And these are the conditions you have to remember. Soft tissue infection sometimes can be confused for a, like cellulitis. And then fracture, you know, even in a fracture also, some many people can get confused because there is a local worm swelling, but there is no fracture line seen. So this is another thing. And then malignancy, lymphomas and leukemias are quite common in children and present. Like an infection, I have seen so many cases where these uh, leukemia patients were uh, uh, presenting like acute osteomyelitis. So one should remember, you know, the differential diagnosis, how they're distributed. 
So what, how do we proceed now once we have a diagnosis? Diagnosis says there is a very less scope for conservative treatment in acute cluster myelitis in children. Of course, very early diagnosis to the extent that you diagnose the edema in an MRI scan and uh, the counts are just elevating. Probably at that stage, maybe IV antibiotics and rest and splinting might help, but most of the time it is invasive uh, procedures which are indicated. So surgical removal of the devitalized tissues, debridement extensively, and we have to start on these children in empirical antibiotic. Empirical antibiotic has to be decided based on the hospital policy. And as, as I said, we have to discuss uh, with the microbiologist. Of course, we don't have a pharma, clinical pharmacologist in, in, in our country, but if there is a facility like that. I think all these people should be involved in the management where the drug dosage, the duration, everything can be charted out because as orthopods, you know, generally the, the, the knowledge of the antibiotics other than few antibiotics are, are quite poor in us. So certainly we have to take help of other departments. So what we have, we, what we start in our hospital is because there is a hospital supply, we start them on uh, cephalosporins. And uh, if there is a suspicion of aggressive infection like uh, MRSA, we start them on vancomycin. Otherwise, it is uh, amicacin and ceftriaxone we start, but the inhibited uh, drugs are cephalosporin third generations like cefazoline, cefaroxine, these are the drugs which are inhibited. In case of MRSA, the, the clindamycin and the vancomycin are the first line of treatment and linozolin should be maintained, um, in, uh, preserved for the oral dosages or um, as a second line of treatment because linozolin has got so many uh, you know, uh, uh, side effects like one minor suppression and one has to be managing this. So primary treatment should be with the vancomycin in case of MRS. This is just an MRI I'm sharing with you, this child, as I was telling you, this child is stuck with us for seven years, six, seven years now. So she's a girl with the, presented with the iliac osteomyelitis and, uh, and also some kind of a fusion in the joint and the hip joints, ipsilateral. We went and debrided and the whole ileum got involved very badly. You can even see some kind of a vascular insert on the femoral head. And this is the sequelae, and finally she ended up with a fused uh, sacroiliac joint and some consolidation and some pelvic obliquity. But now that's what she's doing well. But these are the bad cases. I just wanted to remind that you know, MRSA, which is infecting unusual bones like ileum, can present a very bad uh, problems in the little hand. So what is the duration of the antibiotics? So this is another thing. Traditionally, all these anti, I mean chronic osteom, I mean acute osteomyelitis were treated with. Or if you read Campbell's, I don't know, some even now also general orthopedic uh, indications are four to six weeks of intravenous antibiotics, which is not practically possible, especially in our country. So what we are doing is, it's, it's based on our experience and of course, based on the recent publications by certain uh, people that, you know, the short course intravenous antibiotics, something like till the clinical uh, room and then followed by oral antibiotics for about three to four weeks. This is what we do. So these are the, some of the studies which I was quoting that, you know, this, uh, so we have done a, a prospective randomized uh, study and proved that the short-term antibiotics are quite effective in managing this. And about steroids, I don't really personally use the steroids, but uh, there are people who are using steroids just to reduce the inflammatory load in the beginning. And uh, there are supportive studies for that also. Few lines about epiphyseal osteomyelitis. In osteomyelitis, uh, as all of you know, that it involves mainly the metaphyseal and diaphyseal areas, but epiphyseal osteomyelitis also can happen. So, so the, 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 in this picture, you can see that the signal changes in the proximal tibia and with some kind of a destruction going on in the rotated area. So, if you don't identify them, they, they, they can lead up, they can land up with a very bad deformity later period of time. So, our own friend, Dr. Maulin and Dr. Agarwal, from uh, Delhi and Maulin from Ahmedabad. They, they've, they've done a wonderful uh, series uh, presentation in uh, JPO recently. So there are 18 cases they saw, epiphyseal osteomyelitis. Whenever you see epiphyseal osteomyelitis, the, the, the other organism to be kept in mind in children. So one common organism in our country is the tuberculosis. And it's quite common and uh, you can have bacterial infection as well. So this is just a recent experience of mine. I'm just sharing that, you know, this, this child presented with a lesion in the epiphysis, we just recognized, but the child also had some amount of a, a synovitis in the knee. So we decided to do an arthroscopy first and just see and look at that. There is some kind of a deposition in the 
on the surface and then uh, the joint was not looking nice. So you can see that a lot of uh, debris and synovitis. So these were the findings and then we started searching. So there was a lesion, there was a lesion from the epiphysis, which is coming out of the joint, I mean, coming out of the epiphysial region and then entering the joint and then causing the septic arthritis. So in this video, you can see that this is in front of the ACL and just on the lateral corner, you can see a small opening where the, the infection was leaking into the joint and in turn causing the septic arthritis. So these things can happen. This is just our... Uh, uh, so, uh, Rudra, was it, uh, uh, was it tuberculous? No, 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 no. We just but, about two days back. I'm just waiting for the... So, so send, uh, have you sent the gene expert? No, no, we have not sent anything. We, we are waiting for the culture and gram staining. Uh, so my, in my experience, you know, in all those uh, epiphyseal infections, which were communicating with the joint, they all were tuberculous. No. Because the bacterial infection, before they reach to the joint, they become very symptomatic while tuberculosis. No. So I would suggest you get uh, histopathology and for tuberculosis. Yes, yes. We have, we have sent for histopathology, the bone specimen, whatever I curated, and also the yeah. fragments I have sent it for examination. We are just following it up. Yeah. So what do we do in case of uh, NICU admissions? We admit the child and immediately, as I said, we start them on a septic acid because that is a septic hospital. And then if it is a septic arthritis, we go ahead with the arthrocentesis and arthrotomy to follow. If there is a septic arthritis and if there is a osteomyelitis, we decompress at the same time. So surgical decompression is a very, very important tool and uh, we have learned many, many different approaches. And uh, so this is just, uh, that is about the chronic, I mean, acute osteomyelitis. I'll be sharing, I, we have a discussion on Gigli saw uh, decompression today and also in fact when I shared it with Maulin we also started doing it, it's quite a good method and uh, and other, other uh, it's basically the, the message is one should do a thorough debridement and I'm going to share with you that other thing what we do so surgical debridement is important if there is an infection which goes on for a chronicity it's an extensive approach and uh, thorough debridement and then uh, you know, touch. So this is just a diagram to show that the, the, the windows which are made, um, if there's a long bone involved, probably whatever the length of bone involved, which we come to know by MRI and other clinical findings, we can just make a windows and uh, pass the degrees, uh, do a thorough debridement. I'm sure Mohli is going to show today some uh, videos and techniques. So Rudra, you should send that picture to me. You should gift it to me. I will, I will give you, I'll give you. <laughs> That's so this is another thing, uh, you know, what I found is very useful because the joint replacement surgeons, you know, they, they, they use what is called pulse lavage with a gun. I think all of you must have seen it. And I started recently using it. This is a very good tool. And you don't have to buy this. This costs around uh, 4,000, 3,000, something like that. And we can use it for four or five children. And so I have asked my friends to gift from different corporate hospitals and we keep these things in the hospital and then we use it. So I'll just show you the video. You can appreciate how nicely this pulse lavage uh, gives a very good pressure inside the medullary canal. And then, you know, uh, you can even pass a tube and then you can, uh, so this, this goes with the pressure. So this gives a nice wash in the intramedullary canal. So you can make as many windows as possible. And this is a battery, the striker, you can attach it and this is the gun. So this is a useful thing, you know. So, so whenever there is a chronic osteomyelitis, we have to make a good window, good uh, bone decompression we have to do. And let me tell you a few things about the biocomposite. Whenever the infection comes into uh, the chronic infections, we have this uh, biocomposites that is a calcium sulfate matrix, which is available. And then we can mix the antibiotics, which are there, like tobramycin, vancomycin, all this, whatever, and jetamycin. So this, these three antibiotics are recognized by this company, but we have used other antibiotics also. So basically, it's a local antibiotic delivery system where the, 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 the calcium sulfate crystals will have the antibiotic with them and gradually release it as they get uh, resolved. That's the concept. And 
I must share that you know my own friend Dr. Jayant and Vikas and Girish have kindly uh, published this paper, very nice paper from JPO 2021. So where they have uh, said that most of the infection can be eradicated. So Stimulan is a nice system. Of course, it's a little expensive, but certainly affordable nowadays, and we can use it. So to conclude my talk, let me tell you that one should have a high index of suspicion about early diagnosis. Not only early diagnosis, one should have suspicion about the organisms which may be involved. Like uh, I was telling you about as epiphyseal osteomyelitis, one should think about tuberculosis. If it is a, a child below two years, three years, one should think about Kingella Kinge also. And, uh, and uh, in infants, one should start, I mean, one should suspect strepto and uh, gram negative organisms more commonly, and then use the antibiotic for that age, which is appropriate, which is very important, because everything is not staph aureus as we study in, in, in pediatrics. And then, as I said, it's most of the time it is a surgical intervention. There is no conservative management options, very less options. And as I said with the, um, the reasoning, the short-term parental antibiotic is good enough to have a good resolving you know, infection. And uh, we have to protect against the late sequelae, and we should be, as I said, be aware about the rare organisms, especially when they affect the rare bones like ileum, which I showed you. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Molin and uh, group. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for this wonderful Good talk, morning. and uh, uh, don't forget that uh, giggly show our picture. <laughs> we are yet to publish it, so uh, whenever we we send for publication, we will attach that photograph as well. Certainly. Courtesy Dr. Rudra. So, Sheenam, uh, please uh, take the questions. Okay, sir. Uh, first question is, how long would you wait with antibiotics uh, before surgery? In you know, acute osteomyelitis. Yes. Acute osteomyelitis. Uh, see, see, now we have uh, very good diagnostic tools. We have ultrasound, we have MRI scan, and more than anything, we have a clinical judgment. As I discussed, the clinical judgment is the most important. How bad is the child with respect to toxic response? For example, the child which is not allowing you to touch, there is a swelling, and uh, MRI is showing wide involvement of the marrow. I don't think so. You have to wait. You know, there is no question of waiting. It's basically empirically, you're going to start the antibiotic, and as soon as possible, you're going to intervene with the surgical intervention, decompress the bone. Give a thorough wash, make your antibiotic reach that area. That's the whole concept. Yeah. So typically, sure. you know, I, uh, in a case of acute osteomyelitis, I give IV antibiotics for 48 hours. And if child continues to have pain, fever, then I feel that the intramedullary pressure is so much that antibiotic is no more working not reaching there, and then we should go with the drainage. And at times, if it's an advanced disease, then we have to react early. So next question was, Rudra, which antibiotics you would start uh, at the outset before the culture report comes? Yeah. So as I discussed, you see, it again depends on the local antibiotic policy. You need to have a microbiology sync with your decision because uh, tomorrow, if something going wrong, and then you ask them, they say that you didn't inform me. We don't know. We don't know what's ha happening. So, see, we have an idea, and it's also depending on the general infections what the microbiologist is seeing in the hospital. Microbiologists are the people you know they are seeing general infection. They are not only seeing only osteomyelitis. They see other specialty, you know, like uh, pediatricians are referring for meningitis and other things. So they know better. You know, what are the organism? prevalent in that area, in that, in that setup, you know. Uh, so, so in our hospital, it is most of the time it is a referral. So what we start is, as I said, ceftriaxone is the drug which we, which we start on the initial way because it has got a good coverage for both gram positive and negative. In case of an infants and neonates, in case of children more than five years, of course, we, we give importance to MSSA or MRSA as the primary pathogen, and then still we have used the ceftriaxone. Still, it is good effect, good you know in those uh, organisms. And along with this, we have always used the gram-negative coverage is amic acid. This is our practice. Ceftriaxone and amic acid is what we use in general. So the same thing uh, in our private setup. 
what I have seen that if, if you see a multifocal infection or there is a significant uh, compartment or widening of thigh or the extremity, then you should suspect the septic thrombosis of the uh, vein. And this is usually we see with MRSA. In those cases, we start with a vancomycin. We, I attended an infectious disease conference uh, recently with a pediatrician and the policy which they suggested is to hit hard and hit early. And they recommend using vancomycin and uh, micacin or ceftriaxon to start, start with. And the blood culture and the tissue culture would come in 48 hours. And then you may de-escalate from vanco to ceftriaxon if it is an MSSA. So I have uh, started using that for a long time. I have also used uh, linezolid because linezolid has very limited side effects while vancomycin as this red man syndrome can happen. So uh, we have to give very slowly and those things. But uh, vanco and ceftriaxone combination, we start uh, and then we de-escalate or reduce the drugs accordingly. Yes. Do we have another question, uh, Dr. Sheena? No, sir. Right. So thanks, Rudra, for that wonderful talk and overview. And uh, that was an overview. Now I'll share, you, uh, share one case with all of us. And uh, uh, and uh, that will... So let me go out and then come back. Uh, okay. This PC and desktop. Desktop is a Please uh, wait for a moment and I'll, I'll share my presentation. Desktop pe hai Share screen kia. Idhar Desktop. Oh yeah, this. So, uh, can you see my slide? No, Everyone? No, no, sir. No, not it. Not it. Uh, you you no. need to unshare and share. Uh, stop sir. sharing and share again, right? Abhi? Yes. Uh, we can see now. Right, right. So, I'll, uh, I'm going to share uh, just single case which takes you through the management dilemma, you know. And uh, I'm, I'm sure it will teach many points which Rudra uh, covered in his talk. Somehow I have created a poll, uh, Shalin, but as is Ortho TV guys are sharing, I mean, they also, these polls are not seen anyways. So this is a six years old boy who fell from bicycle and he had a blunt trauma along left upper leg. They went to see an orthopedic surgeon and was prescribed some analgesics after seeing normal x-ray. So this was the x-ray and uh, this was uh, prescribed an analgesic that this would be just blunt trauma. Now at one week, child started developing fever and had a spike of 101 degrees. And there was swelling along proximal medial tibia, which was warm with overlying uh, cellulitic changes. And C-reactive protein was 20 
and count were marginally raised and x-ray was again normal so orthopedic surgeon uh, now let's see take the poll now in this situation x-ray is normal crp is 20 and there was cellulitis over tibia so what would you have done so let there are four options and you can take the poll and uh, put it in chat box that uh, would you start oral antibiotics you would do usg or an mri or ind you for the cellulitic changes so please put in chat box yes i'll give you 10 seconds okay raman will do ind Chinma is in America, so he says both USG followed by MRI. Dr. Neeraj Joshi from Bhavnagar, he would say MRI. So, yeah, so, um, so we are not contemplating what is right or what is wrong, but uh, I felt that 70% people think that MRI should be done. A couple of people thinks that, uh, think that uh, USG will tell you about whether this uh, soft tissue abscess is connecting to the subperiosteal space. Few of you are aggressive. They want to do an IND. No, no one said that oral antibiotic will uh, is a choice. But our um, let's see what uh, orthopedic uh, colleague did. He gave uh, oral antibiotics. Yeah. So he prescribed oral antibiotics because X-ray was normal. So the first point to remember, and as you will understand with the progress of this case that a normal x-ray does not mean that there is no bone infection. It requires 40% bone to be destroyed to be seen on x-ray as a lytic uh, lesion. Okay, so uh, we must understand normal x-ray that does not mean there is no bone penetration. We should take make all the efforts to see whether there's just soft tissue infection or it's an associated bone infection. Now let's see the story ahead at two weeks, patient is still febrile. And they again approached orthopedic surgeon and now swelling has increased in size and it is fluctuant. So there is an abscess formation. And at present, at, as a repeat X-ray was done, third X-ray, which was also normal. And so orthopedic surgeon thought that this is not my case. This, this is, uh, bone is not involved, so let me refer them to a surgeon. So patient was referred to a general surgeon that there is an abscess. So you do IND and uh, X-ray is normal, so it's not my job. And IND was done by the surgeon, which was the first surgery for this child. So now poll two is what you would have done in this situation. Let me give you four options. You would have done same. Would you have referred this child to surgeon or you have given IV antibiotics or you would have investigated. So Garo says MRI. Yeah, Chinmay is of similar opinion. Shinam, Punit, Dr. Neeraj Bhai, yes. And Raman said I would do IND and uh, if see that whether if it is communicating there's subperiosteal, I would drain it. Uh, okay, that's not a bad approach. But Raman, you know, it's um, doing directly IND may, I mean, may not give you the extent of total disease. Bone debridement, if, if it is involved, I agree. But we have seen, you know, uh, skip lesions in distal metaphysis, and sometimes just doing IND and drilling in this case may not be sufficient. So my personal answer to this would be to image and do MRI probably if possible. So let's see what our friend did. So the surgeon did IND, but the IND side is still pouring pus at three weeks. And he got confused that usually when I do IND in two, three days, the, uh, the pus stops coming out. But in this side, for one week, the pus kept on coming. And now the swelling has appeared on the other side of proximal tibia. 
and so he confidently drained the other side he said there must be cellulite is on the other side which has localized with antibiotics so let me drain the other side okay so this was the second surgery so now the patient is still a with a general surgeon so all clinical parameters in favor of acute osteoma yes raman i agree with you but this is the patient who was in the periphery of amdabad and the orthopedic surgeon thought this way so he uh, transferred the care to the general surgeon so he did second surgery second ind on the lateral side and see what happens now it is 5 weeks now the discharge has reduced from ind side so surgeon and the family is happy but child when started weight bearing he complained of pain in the upper leg so again orthopedic reference was done that now it is bone pain so you go to orthopedic surgeon and he got another x ray and now this is the x ray picture so we must remember that 70% of extremity abscess has underlying bone involvement unless there is preceding factor like a local and a local insect bite or a local trauma or low iv line extravasation in uh, young children now we have done this study and the 70% of extremity abscess underlying bone involvement and so always go for an ultrasound or an mri uh, when there is absence of this pre preceding factors so let's see now what happened at two and a half months the orthopedic surgeon said the child is already on antibiotics the wounds are not draining much so he again gave some analgesics and uh, he gets usg because the uh, pain persisted and now uh, radiology says there is some subperiosteal collection and metaphyseal irregularity so now the surgeon did the drainage of subperiosteal space and made some drill holes in proximal tibial metaphyses okay that was a third surgery so let let me ask you again do you agree with the treatment and what should be the action now let me give you the options yes i will allow the child for weight bearing as tolerated yes the option was okay i will apply plaster to child becomes asymptomatic no this was not appropriate management i would have added local antibiotic delivery system and d no i would have got further imaging so please show your polls so punit says yes plaster gora when chin may wants to do mri Tina is also keen on getting MRI. Uh, Nirad Joshi says a local antibiotic system like Stimulan. Plaster. Yakub says D. Now, whoever has made this marking, you know, would it disappear in next slide or it would remain there? I have not made it. Piyush says um, local antibiotic delivery system. I agree. see uh, in this cases you know when multiple surgeries are done we need to know the extent of disease we think that uh, just doing by multiple drill holes the intramedullary pressure will get decompressed but we have seen we do not want to make drill holes we want to make a small window so that it would allow us to completely decompress not only the metaphyses but also the medullary canal now without mri it is difficult to uh, assess whether the it is a panosseous disease or it was uh, uh, it's a local metaphyseal disease the culture showed uh, staph aureus okay so let's see what happens next so the surgeon orthopedic surgeon said i will allow weight bearing as tolerated so that was pretty uh, a non conventional management was done now at 5 months child suddenly stops walking and again the orthopedic surgeon uh, was consulted and this is the x ray picture okay so now what you can see here is goro can you read this x ray what is happening Yes, sir. So now there are pathological fractures seen in the shaft and the and the proximal metaphyses. Hmm. 
so one can see this drill holes and one must remember that uh, a spontaneous pathological fracture can happen at the junction of diseased and undiseased area uh, in osteomyelitis when this periosteal health is no good okay so a circumferential abscess makes the underlying periosteum devitalized and makes it prone for pathologic fracture. And this paper in JBJS 2010 must be read. This is from TSR. I'll share that paper later. Now, my poll uh, is what should be done now? The patient has a pathological fracture at both ends. Should we do plaster immobilization with dressing through window, a debridement and X-fix or Elizaro? Debridement and antibiotic mixed nail or further imaging. Please put your poll and the, the person who has done marking, you know, please remove it. So Gaurav wants further imaging, Chinmay wants further imaging. Raman says uh, remove the dead bone. Shinam says uh, further imaging. Debridement and X-fix or Elizaro. Raman says uh, debridement, put him in cast. Right. So many options, uh, many thought process. One can also think of putting some uh, uh, the spacer or something. But the, first of all, we need to see whether the underlying bone is completely devitalized or it is partially viable. But let's see what the surgeon, uh, the treating doctor tried to do. He thought that this is a small child, so it will heal. So let me give plaster and we'll do dressing through the window. So this is what was done. So he kept on doing dressings with, through the window. Patient was immobilized. And at eight months, this was the clinical picture. Plaster was removed and patient shifted to our care. Patient came to us and said, now we, we want to see. Now, um, Chinmay, can you read this X-ray on the right side? What do you see? Yes, sir. Uh, now we can clearly see in the proximal third part, there is a tibialized bone, which is uh, showing the pathological fracture also with the sequestrum uh, all, ar all around it in the middle of the medullary canal. And the shaft uh, and the in uh, involvement of the bone is up to the lower third, middle third junction. Uh, and in the... Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so there is an... Uh... Uh, a small sequester in the distal part. Rudra, how would you manage this full condition now? Yeah. So, anyway, so the imaging is not done still. The MRI is not available. No. Okay. Anyway, at this stage, I think uh, this is going to end up in a gap non-union. We have faced similar situations. You know, this, this middle fragment is going to come out and uh, followed by a good debridement and just maintain the length by whatever means probably external fixator or even even a simple slab and then or another option would be antibiotic uh, impregnated cement in that area like a spacer and then uh, what we have done is after some eight weeks or six weeks we go remove that cement spacer and immediately do either uh, bone transport uh, that, that's, the, that's the best uh, option, I would think of. Yeah. The cases. Right. So, so I had a similar, uh, similar thought process that I would do bone transport. And uh, as fibula is intact, the length is maintained and uh, with a fixator uh, also. So I did not, at that point, I think I did this case in way back in 2011. So I did not uh, put any cement spacer, but... Uh, we removed the sequestrum and placed the Elizaro frame. And uh, even I did not get MRI because I'm, I was going to open everything and deprive it. So with the using of pediatric reamers, we decompressed the canal, thoroughly lavaged, and then put the frame thinking that once the infection settles down, we'll do distal corticotomy and transport. So that was the fourth surgery for this poor child. And then I came to uh, uh, I came to see this paper from our Sandeep Patwardhan and colleagues from Pune uh, that reconstruction of bone defects after osteomyelitis with non-vascularized fibula graft. And we all uh, read the abstracts of paper and not papers in detail. So I jumped 
to put a fibula graft thinking that this will reduce the time of treatment so 6 weeks after primary procedure when the crp and counts were normal there was no evidence of any discharge the wound everything was looking fine i placed the fibula now later realized that uh, uh, the sandeep and colleague said that there should not be diameter difference when you put a graft so this fibula strut graft works very well in numerous uh, in a proximal uh, in the tip uh, the forearm but when it comes to tibia and femur the when diameter mismatch is there it might fail but in other in this case what happened everything was fine that was a fifth surgery the question to all of you is would you agree with this sort of management yes or no as the bed was dry i placed fibula and did some bone grafting iliac crest grafting would you have done the same uh, please give your poll shinam would have done same punit no neeraj bhai say no yakub say yes yeah gorav says i will put two straights uh, two struts or bone transport yes so uh, punit what would you have done can you tell us hello sir i am yeah, audible yeah punit yes sir uh, like uh, we are uh, if you are using a fibula graft uh since the bone ends are not very healthy uh, uh our expectation of union with the non vascular fibula fibula graft will be uh, like a little uh, too much to ask for sir what i would have done is uh, probably uh, done a fibulectomy then slowly dock the two ends and later on lengthen the tibia rather than going for a transport in this case right so that that will be again a long surgical time but that is also an option i agree with you so let's see uh, what happens next uh i did this uh, fibula grafting and patient called after 3 weeks for suture removal but when i called the father was very angry with me there is frank pus discharge from the bone so it happens so sometimes you know for 6 weeks or 8 weeks you the the bed looks okay and you perform a surgery and the infection gets flared up that's what happened in this case There was a frank pus discharge, and the whole fibula was sequestrated. So, what can be done now? So, now cutting the story short, we did uh, we removed the fibula, we debrided the thing, whatever dirty tissue was there, and uh, we did the distal corticotomy and started doing transport, which was a sixth surgery. And uh, then, as we did the extensive debridement. fortunately there was no infection uh, at the proximal site bone grafting was done once the docking happened and you can see the distal uh, area was virgin and it threw good new bone which was a seventh surgery the frame was removed after consolidation and plaster was applied for four weeks which was the eighth surgery and after plaster removal child was allowed to bear weight with ptb breast first time after one and a half years and uh, this is five years follow up of that boy he is 11 years old now and he is walking like this so what i mean to say is a simple uh, acute osteomyelitis which due to the ignorance about not all soft tissue abscess are just soft tissue we should look beyond this child lost about one and half two years of his life uh because of a small ignorance so i want all of you to become a torch bearer that whenever you see a soft tissue infection in a child without preceding uh, factors always investigate if not mri then ult then ultrasound and as gora rightly said this could have avoided if we would have been aware of this phenomenon and i'm i'm glad that this 20 people are witnessing this case and they will uh, teach in their their uh, groups uh that how to deal with this and this five years follow up the nature is so uh, forgiving the fibula looks good the mom said what happened to that fibula which we took but the fibula 
has regenerated very well. Yes, Raman, your comment. Yeah, sir. Good morning. Yes. Actually, uh, this is definitely a great savior for the child, right? But yeah. I, I wanted to, I wanted to like uh, know from your expert opinion and Dr. Rudra sir's opinion. Uh, this is like five years back. The child was around five or six when this uh, the whole picture, uh, whole scene started to be created, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when he first went with the acute osteomyelitis. And then there was a stage when there was a dead bone in between and still there was some pus. So means we have been taught like if you debride it thoroughly and stabilize the joints, then in this small age group, like in this age group of uh, small children, like uh, four a year, five year, three years, the whole bone start to reappear yeah. again. The whole, I mean, this, Osteomyelitis thing thing is taken care of. So this is a so, false teaching. I'm very boldly, I will tell you. This okay. is a false teaching. Now, like Rudra and me and many, all of us have seen many gap non-unions in children as young as one year, two year, three year. See, what is important to understand is periosteum has two source of blood supply. One is intramedullary and other is compartmental. So intramedullary blood supply cuts off when there is acute osteomyelitis because of increased intramedullary pressure. So all the uh, intramedullary blood supply gets blocked. Now, when there is a circumferential abscess in the muscle compartments, that will also obliterate the compartmental blood supply. So that underlying periosteum will become dead to throw new bone. So when there is a long-standing infection like this, with uh, devitalized overlying periosteum, those children will go into gap non-union. Now, Gaurav has shared one paper of us. So we have published this paper on which are the factors which affect the outcome of chronic osteomyelitis. So don't be in that a false uh, information that young children, if stabilized, they will do well. No, we have to uh, drain the abscess both the intramedullary as well as compartmental so that the blood supply of periosteum quickly restarts so that it can throw involucrum. If patient has uh, elapsed four or five weeks since the disease or there is circumferential uh, abscess, those children are highly likely to develop gap non-union at any age. I will share that paper and you, you all should read it. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. That. Right. So, I think learning points uh, from this is underlying bone involvement should be ruled out. MRI-based disease debridement is paramount. Prevention is better than cure. Stands true. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. And... Uh, Shalin, uh, I mean, uh, Gaurav, you can share your screen. Rudra, any, any comment uh, on this? Yeah, I'm just about that uh, last case, what Dr. Raman was asking, the same thing. You know, we, we, we as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, we should understand that, you know, uh, the, bone, the bone formation happens because of many reasons. One is it should have a blood vessel, it should have a periosteum, and or some kind of a medullary canal, there should be something. If everything is gone, then from where the where does the bone come? In fact, with this, you know, nice joke I must share. You know, one of my pediatric uh, surgery colleagues always used to say that there is nothing there in pediatric doctor. Any broken bone, you just put it in a room, they unite. This, this is a concept, you know, we should not uh, we should not adapt. So I think the, the 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 best solution is to have a good knowledge about certain things, like for example, the proximal tibia. It's a, it's a vascularly compromised area. Only one nutrient uh, artery enters there and then if that is gone, that's why we commonly see these areas going into non-unions and gap non-unions. So, yeah, Gaurav, start yeah. your case. I hope I'm audible and my screen is visible. Yeah. Okay, so 
let us start with the case so this is a one and a half year old child presented with complaints of fever pain and purulent discharge from the proximal and medial aspect of his left leg since three weeks and as sir shown in his previous case that he also went ind incision drainage over the proximal aspect of left leg elsewhere but still the wound was not healing and there was continuous purulent discharge. These were his x-rays when he presented to us. So, we, we straight away got an MRI as our protocol and we found that the infection was extending throughout the tibia till the lower end and there was... So, go back to the x-ray, Gaurav. Right, sir. So, I remember that uh, before this orthopedic colleague drained it, the x-ray was normal. Right. So he did the just IND and then uh, the, as the pus kept on coming, they got an imaging and now they show this is a pyanosseous osteomyelitis and patient was referred to us. So again, this is the same story as we discussed in the last case. Yeah, right. go ahead. Yeah, so we can see on the MRI that there is a significant periosteal elevation and intramedullary collection throughout the uh, canal. So, so as learned from Sir, pan medullary decompression and debridement was carried out using a giggly saw wire as we can't use solid reamers from a single port or we have to make multiple entries or slit the bone. So to avoid all those things, we use giggly saw wire and drainage of subperiosteal and intermuscular abscess was also done. So this is a small video to show how it is done and why it is done. So we know that solid reamers are difficult to negotiate into the canal of kids, whereas the giggly saw wire is serrated throughout and is flexible enough to be to be negotiated into the canal. So we make an entry where the maximum infection is and then through that entry we we make a access into the intramedullary canal and then we negotiate our giggly saw wire by bending its tip and we try to transport it throughout the canal and then we ream with the with the met, uh, with the giggly saw wire through all the walls multiple times rotating it in all the directions so that we we remove all the necrotic tissue sticking around the canal and in the canal similar uh, uh, depiction of uh, by pictures and then yes and then we lavage the canal with a infant feeding tube and so in this case we did the same and this is the same child after one month of surgery and this is the same child after six months of surgery now we can see that the bone is consolidating the infection has healed and now the uh, cortex is thickening and this is the same child at six years. There was no limb length discrepancy and growth plates were normal and the infection healed well. So uh, I just wanted to tell that this is a similar case as shown by sir, but then early timely intervention and right intervention, thorough debridement saved around two years and a lot of morbidity of the child. So this is open for discussion. Thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. And this case is is shared, I mean, it's Sir's case, which I, which I saw and, and I'm using it from the permission of Sir. I learned it from during my fellowship time. Thank you, Sir. Thank you, Gaurav. Uh, so this, this case, I mean, I can <clears throat> send this to uh, all of you. You all can present it wherever your meetings, because this is a good learning point to decompress the narrow canal without disturbing the, uh, the, what you say, the bony anatomy further. So, Rudra, your comments, and then we'll go for the next case. Yeah, I just wanted to, because see, when I discussed with you about this, uh, when you were here last time, three years back, two, two, two years back, mm -hmm. I started doing the same thing, but the only problem what we found was the giggly saw always comes in rotated, you know. It doesn't come like a straight uh, wire. It's always wound up and then, then it is supplied, you know, that's how it is supplied. But when, when we want to insert that completely, many a time it doesn't go to the desired length. 
it goes to some uh, place and then it gets stuck and you know we start but i understand that you know wherever there is a loosening or there is a more infection this would negotiate till there and then it won't go further to a normal go it requires more force so this is my observation just a comment so uh, so depending on the size of canal you know what we have done with a plier we have compressed the loop of giggly saw and we have just bent it a little bit so that it can be negotiated and uh, it will go through like so we have to make sure that this is uh, now if uh, we have seen that at some time it does not go through the distal uh, diaphysis then what you do is you do a double giggly saw so bend it half and then yeah. curl it and then because there it will be more force and you will be able to do that the second thing is you can uh, uh, you should avoid using same wire again and again because if you use wire they are very fragile the third thing is uh, the giggly saw wire can be local made and there is a very standard made so i have always been using ormed so it that ormed giggly saws are very strong and you you are not in fear that it will break down in my early practice we had one case where uh, the giggly saw wire was broken and inside and uh, we were not able to retrieve you know because it was a bit higher so we i told family that it is there and if uh, there is something then i'll make another window above and remove it but fortunately that uh, child healed completely and till date before and it was it happened before 10 years there is no symptom so giggly saw wire is a new technique we all should have faith in and uh, it has worked now why my paper which has been sent to many places has not been accepted so far where we do not have controls for me controls are the patients who have been treated by other orthopedic surgeon by just doing local drill holes and they kept on draining or inadequate debridement are the controls for me that's why i uh, started doing this but i am uh, trying to get it published with uh, uh, by some you know uh, some adjustments and some further detailing of the study right so the, this, this giggly saw wire technique uh, should be uh, used it's it has been greatly helpful to all of us yes chinmay would like to share your screen yes sir uh abba question about uh, embolism with uh, pulse lavage well pulse lavage is done in all these uh, adult orthopedic surgeries as well you know i doubt that the pulmonary embolism which you are talking about might be a part of mrsa disease the mrsa osteomyelitis has a triad it's known as lethal triad of osteomyelitis uh septic thromboembolism of the venous system and septic pulmonary emboli so last month we treated two cases both of them have pulmonary embolism and uh, so it might not be due to pulse lavage but it might be due to the disease itself what do you say rudra what is your experience yeah the same thing in so pulse lavage see even in uh, acute uh, debridements so sometimes we put this rail tube or some tube inside the canal wherever we go and then we give with the under pressure if pulse lavage you know can cause embolism even the you know the pressure under pressure injecting also should come but i don't think so that's the reason as you said the infection infection and then local trauma by all these things are the reasons and then pulse lavage is not going to create uh, so much of pressure that you know you are dislodging into a vessel especially inside a bone is very much unlikely right chinmay please go ahead yes sir Uh, good morning, all. Uh, myself, Doctor Chinma. I am presenting a case of osteomyelitis fever. So, a local orthopedic surgeon from Tarsil called me, and he told me that I am referring you a patient, which is a ten years old, a girl, which is a known case of sickle cell anemia. She is unable to weight bear and having a high grade fever since last ten fifteen days. So, I asked about a little about the past history. So, in past history, she had a blood transfusion two months back. on the day two she had a fire uh, fever spike which was subsided by taking some uh, antibiotic medication but no uh, no antibiotics and swelling around the knee uh, was noticed around 10 to 15 days after that and it was aspirated two times by local orthopedic surgeon and the culture was sent and it shows that it comes uh, e coli and appropriate antibiotic was started but 
as the knee swelling get uh, repeatedly uh, repeated knee swelling is there there is a toxic look high grade fever and she was now unable to wet bear so after she comes to me after two month uh, taking uh, the treatment all over the place she come to the district place and on clinical examination she is having persistent toxic look and toxic look tender to touch around the knee and the proxim uh, knee and the uh, femur unable to perform the range of motion in hip and knee the ankle are free minimal patellar tap is positive no distal neurovascular deficit upper limb and other limb examination were normal on investigation her blood count is a uh, uh, 9.8 platelet was on lower side 154 wbc is 15000 crp is raised and esr is 40 by considering the clinical examination and the investigational uh, investigational part Uh, it's fall into the cred algorithm which suggested that it must be a septic arthritis which suggests that unable unable to wear bed fever blood count esr and the crp uh, crp but is it a only a septic joint because by looking on the examination uh, or uh, the chronicity of the disease since last two months i think it should it not not just only the septic joint it must be a more so i uh, i found a one paper in the literature by rosenfeld which was published in jpo we suggest to uh, they uh, come up with the five variables age crp duration of symptom platelet at anc so age greater than 4 crp greater than 13.8 duration greater than 3 platelet count less than 340 and anc greter than 8.6 if any uh, three positive variables are present you can go directly for the pre operative mri to look for the osteomyelitis which also involving the septic arthritis by following this paper i go for the mri and we can see there is a inter uh, pan osseous osteomyelitis with a pus pocket in a, on the medial as well as on the lateral side on the uh, joint line there is a epiphyseal osteomyelitis also present with a gross destruction of the joint cartilage which was present after two months to me uh, on of course i also go for the x ray on the x ray we can see there is a joint destruction uh, as well as there is a no a maintenance of the joint line and there is a subluxation of the joint and this child is in persistent fever in a toxic and he is in little going towards the septic uh, shock uh so my plan will be the parent counseling the parent counseling in the form of that the joint is destructed uh, right now for getting rid of the infection is more important rather than uh, is more important for me drainage of the medial pocket uh, medial uh, pocket pus jiggly saw medullary canal drainage and dead space management uh so this is the uh, video which i uh, go a medial side pocket drainage we can you can clearly say there is a gush of the pus will come out like this Uh, from the medial, I mean, you open it and do a finger dissection. Uh, hesitant to put any artery or anything inside it, and do a, all finger uh, uh, dissection and put all the medullary pus, which was sent for pus culture and sensitivity. And the uh, similarly uh, from the lateral side, I uh, made a window, and as 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 Gaurav sir and Molin sir taught me about the uh, medullary decompression, I put the uh, jiggly saw, and you can see there is a continuous gush of pus coming from the medullary canal. uh similarly i am not able to go for the proximal part so i made a window in the proximal part of the femur and uh, again go for uh, go for the jiggly saw and this is the technique uh, which was which is which was taught me to, by dr molin sir and uh, because uh, we uh, thoroughly debrid this space there is a continuous gush of pus coming from the bone uh, i thought uh, the dead space management is also important in this child so i go with the uh, pma uh, polymethyl arcalate cement plus vancomycin and put it over a uh, um, ss wire and uh, kept inside the joint for the local uh, local antibiotic uh, action uh, inside the femur joint and uh, in the post op protocol i have kept the child non weight bearing uh, crp between 48 to 70 hour x ray on 14 days oral antibiotics were continued for 6 weeks the pus culture came e coli positive again and uh, it was and he is positive for ceprofloxacin and the removal of bits was done after the 6 weeks so after uh, after 3 months as i expected there will be a uh, there will be a joint deformity so we can clearly see there is a proximal uh, proximal tibia deformity the tibia is going into the varus uh, on the walking side uh, she is walking uh, with support and without support both but her knee is getting very stiff uh, she is hardly able to do a 20 degree of knee flexion uh this is at another uh, view uh, she can walk uh, she is unable to walk uh, properly because of the no knee flexion at the joint line 
So the antibiotic bits was removed after six weeks. Uh, but when the antibiotic bits were removed, I was not there. I uh, came here for my fellowship in San Diego. So parents will counsel about the further management, but uh, parents not are not yet ready for to get in, uh, for the further management. The situation for me right now is uh, about the stiff knee and a proximal knee, uh, proximal tibial deformity, which I once go over there and will see for the full length X-ray, see for the joint line deformity and the repeat MRI will look for the any cartilage, uh, uh, how are the position of the cartilage and we'll uh, proceed further. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jinmay. Yes. Yeah, so Rudra, your comments Jinmai. on this. Uh, because when you showed that, uh, you know, there was a effusion in the joint and it was looking like a septic arthritis, this is something like the same what I presented, but did you uh, thought about septic arthritis, which is connecting into the knee and did you do something uh, to know what's happening inside the knee? Yes, sir. I also drained for the knee joint also, sir. Uh, uh, knee joint also drained, uh, but, but there is no much, there is only infected synovium inside the joint. And no as such collection was seen on the MRI also, but uh, on clinically examination, there is a minimal patellar tap positive, but when I open it, uh, after all, there is only infected synovium, sir. So I would anyway, see, look, looking at the involvement, like this is practically a septic arthritis along with the osteomyelitis. And even the x-ray also shows when there is a loss of the medial whole tibial condyle, obviously everything is involved. And uh, probably, you know, arthroscopic synovectomy or thorough debridement, I think it's, it's, it's a good option to, you should have cons considered, you know, that's what I feel. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, I also spoke with my orthoscopic surgeon, but they don't have the special pediatric scope. So I have to go for the open uh, debridement of the joint. Uh, by opening the all the joint, I able to remove as much as possible and thorough aggressive debridement was done uh, in the same setting, sir. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> those who have not trained for arthroscopy, you know, it's something, it's a simple two portal thing and uh, many primary septic arthritis can be drained with arthroscopy. Of course, when if you're not trained, you do an arthrotomy, that's not, not a problem. But in similar, in such cases, doing multiple incisions, you can use arthroscopy as well. Now, for all sequel cell, you know, before you embark on the treatment, of course, your case was infected. You must see the child should not be in sickle cell crisis. Sickle cell crisis with low hemoglobin and uh, a patient is dehydrated. Many a times the pain and symptoms are more from the sickle cell crisis than the infection. I'm not talking about your case. Your case is kind of neglected and burnt out septic arthritis. So the management uh, which you have done is fine. And... Uh, Many a times, you know, when there are multiple treatment has been done and there is repeated or recurrent infection, I have used Stimulan. Uh, I've never used uh, putting that cemented antibiotic beads on a nail because I do not want to do another surgery, you know. Uh, so at times I have done multiple small drill holes and through those drill holes I have poured stimulant beads so that it will reach intermedullary. Uh, then there are also some ways of, uh, of uh, putting uh, this similar beads through a small incision. But that's fine, uh, putting that there's an old technique. Uh, also, what you can do is, besides putting two wires from there, you can put a straight rod, antibiotic mixed nail, which would uh, liberate Venko and Genta, depending on the culture which mm. can be placed from the greater trochanter, which will also okay. give you stability to prevent any fracture and that you can remove easily with a single incision at the top. But okay. it's a difficult and challenging case and uh, there is instability at the knee joint. Uh, osteoarthritis is already established, so this child would need joint replacement sooner. Yes. And uh, at the same time, correction of the deformity can be done later. So I think, thank you everyone for this lovely uh, session. Uh, thanks Rudra for your valuable inputs. You poured your experience and I'm, I'm hopeful this, uh, this session will be of great help to everyone. Thank so you. We are overshooted by 20 minutes. I'm stop recording. <laughs>